This is Amy, and you're listening to the Talking Appalachian Podcast. Hi, everybody. I hope that you're staying warm in the middle of this deep freeze, and if you were in the snowstorm path, that you are okay, and you've got your soup and your cornbread, and you're able to enjoy some time by the fire. This is a good time, by the way, to catch up on your reading, and I've got a great author for you, Rick Bragg. If you haven't read his work, I really recommend it. He is a memoir writer. He's written several books about his mother and his grandfather. He's got a recipe book. Let me give you some titles. All Over But the Shoutin', Ava's Man, The Best Cook in the World, and then I think his most recent book is one that he wrote about his dog. I'll have all of the titles in the show notes. I discovered Ava's Man first and read it, and I just absolutely soaked up the language, the way that he uses language. And to tell you how good he is with language, he won the Pulitzer Prize for journalism when he was at the New York Times. So he's also got a collection of his best journalistic pieces. But he's from Alabama. He's Southern. He's Sounds very much like me. And he writes about working class people. His family were sharecroppers and he came up poor, but he lived a rural life. And he, there's just so much that resonates. If you're from Appalachia or you're from the South, there's so much about his work that resonates. So Rick and I had the opportunity to sit down where I work at UVA's College at Wise in front of an audience and talk. We were had a couple of chairs on stage, and he did some reading beforehand, and then we had our conversation. So that explains why you're going to hear an audience in the background laughing at his stories. And so I wanted to repurpose this interview because it's just sort of been sitting as an audio file, and it's such a great... I mean, he's funny. He talks about the craft of writing. He talks about some of his work as a journalist. He talks about his books and he reads from a couple of his books. And so wanted to share this with you. It's a long interview, so I'm doing it in two parts. And this first part, he's reading from his work first before he sits down to talk with me. And then um, the second part will just pick up in the middle of our interview. So I hope you enjoy. Hey, if you're enjoying the podcast and you want to join our Facebook community or our Patreon community, please follow the links in the show notes. You can subscribe on our Patreon community and get bonus content and early access to episodes. Another way you can support us is by purchasing the Talkin' Appalachian desk calendar on Etsy. It's one word or expression a month for 12 months. You get 12 Appalachian words and expressions, and you get to support the podcast at the same time. And it's still early enough in the year that you can grab a calendar for yourself or a gift for someone else and enjoy it all year long. And that's on Ivy Attic Company on Etsy. All the links will be in the show notes. All the links are on our Facebook and Instagram communities. We're also on YouTube now. So please go on over there and subscribe if you like YouTube. And you'll get our podcast episodes plus Southern Salon podcast episodes. Thanks, everybody. And keep talking Appalachian. What I thought I might do is talk just a little bit about the first book, All Over But the Shouting. And maybe read you a couple of paragraphs. Well, they're long paragraphs. But a couple of paragraphs uh, of the most recent book, which revisits my mom. So can I borrow your book? I started my writing life writing about my my people, and in particular my mom, who really did drag me up and down a million miles of cotton so that I'd have a chance to, to do this, I guess. And, and uh, she really did go 18 years without a new dress so that I would have school clothes. She really did uh, take in laundry and ironing, uh, worked in a truck stop, did all those things, raised me by herself and my brothers, and uh, so, really, a lot of my writing life has really been, has really been, I would say, dedicated to her, but it's rooted in, in her, and in her people. Uh, I noticed on the way over here the things that were named for coal. You know, all the things that were named for coal, and I had people that dug coal. I had people who spun steel. I had people who worked in cotton mills, which are really just coal mines above ground. So I hope 
and I don't believe that we will need an interpreter. I, I have given talks where I did feel I badly needed one. I went over to London to, to, uh, on a book tour one time, and I was cornered in the bathroom, which ain't as bad as it sounds, but I was cornered in the bathroom by a young man from Ireland. And it, it, I think the Irish have the most beautiful accents on the planet. I mean, you know, they have beautiful accents except for ours. We have the most beautiful accent on the planet. They have the second most beautiful <laughs> accent on... I never really liked very much Parisian accents because they sound like they couldn't change their own tire. You know what I mean? Like if they broke down on the highway, you know, you'd have to go, you know, have to stop, change your tire. But this gentleman, anyway, I digress. The, the gentleman in, in the restroom was, he had that kind of Irish accent that is very, very, very fast. And he was talking so very, 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 very fast, but he would punctuate every like 30 seconds with the most beautiful display of cussing that I have ever heard. And cussing is kind of universal. And, but he wouldn't let me go. I mean, again, he had me hemmed in in the corner. And I, I began to realize after a while that he was very enthusiastic about the books and he was glad to see me. But cuss so much that I took me a while to catch on. Now, I can cuss, but I, he could cuss. And, and, uh, and then he'd stab the air, and he'd stab my chest with his finger. Like, Although I don't understand the thing he said, I would just say, yeah. And, and it went on for about 30 minutes. Being hemmed in the bathroom for 30 minutes is not something I want y'all to ever have to endure. I won't need an interpreter. And I realize that some of you from, are from all over the country and even beyond. And, but as a lot of you, your, your lives and pasts are rooted here. And uh, you'll probably recognize some of these people and things that I talk about. The first page of All Over But the Shouting is, um, was written for this reason. I wanted to honor my mama for doing all those things. But I knew that the reason she had to do them was my daddy, who raised fighting chickens and fought, raised fighting dogs to fight in pits. He was uh, uh, drank real hard. He killed a Chinese soldier in Korea by holding his head underwater. So he was not a gentle man. And, uh, and my mother paid for that. But I didn't want to start the book by whining. But I knew I had to explain my daddy before I wrote the book on my mom. And I tried to think of, and since we've got a bunch of writing teachers in here, I was looking for a metaphor or a simile I still don't know the difference between a metaphor and a simile, <laughs> but I have a vague idea of what they are, and I'm not kidding. I just say an image. I, I needed an image, and I searched my childhood for it. And the, I thought about redbirds. I know y'all have cardinals here, but we just called them redbirds. And so I wanted to use that metaphor or simile, whichever the hell it is, as a, you know, as, as my way into it. And one scene kind of has always stuck in my mind. So we began it with, I used to stand amazed and watch the Redbirds fight. They would flash and flutter like burning rags through a sky unbelievably blue, swirling, soaring, plummeting. And on the ground, they were a blur of feathers stabbing for each other's eyes. And I've seen grown men stop what they were doing, stop pulling corn or lift their head out from under the hood of a broken down truck just to watch it. And once, when I was little, I saw one of the birds peck itself to death in the side mirror of the truck hurling itself against that unyielding image until the glass was cracked and smeared with blood. And I asked a, a man who worked for my Uncle Ed, an old snuff-dipping man named Charlie Bivens. I said, Charlie, why do you reckon that bird did that? And he told me it was just its nature. And that was my daddy. 
You know, he hated what he saw, and it, that was just his nature. And um, it seemed to work really good until I did a talk at Sewanee, and the entire f- senior class stood up and said, what was that about? And uh, I had to explain it. Uh, and it didn't have anything to do with where we were. It just occurred to me that that I hadn't done a really good job necessarily of building that bridge. Or maybe I hadn't done a really good job of building that bridge for folks that had not lived those ordeals. And usually by the time you get some gray on you, you have lived at least one of those ordeals. This place looks like home. Your landscape is more dramatic. It may be one of the prettiest places I've ever seen. And I've seen a camel train walk across the desert in Central Asia, and I have saw a voodoo priest in Haiti try to turn me into a goat, <laughs> which, as far as we know, was unsuccessful. But, you know, in a lot of horror movies, when you see, you know, it's, you know, you think you're safe and you get through life, and then one day you're just a goat. And I've seen a bull elephant in Africa, you know, chase a whole bunch of people, including me, uh, and I might have climbed a tree. I've seen some, some wondrous things, but, but this is a truly beautiful place. And to know that the ground underneath in so many communities here is honeycomb with people who gave their life to digging that coal out of the ground makes me feel very much at home, and and I appreciate it. My mom got sick, and um, she had cancer, and and I was terrified that we would lose her, and we didn't lose her. She beat it, survived even two and a half years of chemo, and it's right now throwing sticks of firewood at my dog because it has eaten all the cat's food. She's not a very accurate thrower. So the dog is not in any real peril, but he's only got one eye. He's got a beautiful blue eye, which he cannot see out of, and a brown eye that he can see out of. And even if you can't hit a bear in the ass with a handful of sand, you, the chances of her blinding him are fair. Uh, and I can't get it through to her. Finally, she said, well, hon, I won't hit him on the blind side. And I thought, you don't know which side is the blind side. <laughs> but uh, I was afraid uh, at one point, about three years ago, that, that we were going to lose her. And the most terrified I was was when uh, uh, she was in the hospital and I was uh, assigned the task of going home and getting her a change of clothes. And I have to do things like that because no one in my family believes I have a real job. If you don't get dirty, you don't have a real job. So I have no job. I have three jobs. I've been hit in the head with a chunk of concrete. I've been tear gassed in five, six countries. I've been chased by the followers of bin Laden through a place, honest to God, called the Bazaar of the Storytellers. You can't make that up. But I, my people think I am a delicate flower because I don't work. Writing, apparently, they do. You know, if you tell them that you write, they think that you cut out paper dolls for a living. <laughs> so I get to do all the, I talk to the doctors, I go get the clothes. I have the night shift in the hospital, you know, sitting with mom because, why? Because I don't ever have to get up in the morning and go to work. I have no job. But I walked into that house to get those clothes that one day, and uh, I went in through the kitchen, and it was just wrong. Because kitchens in my mother's house smell like pinto beans and ham, crackling cornbread, stewed squash and onions. It has that clean smell of bacon biscuits and fresh-cut cantaloupe. Because we do eat healthy down here. But we eat our cantaloupe with sausage, gravy, and biscuits. But none of that was there. She had been in the hospital for months, and, and I thought when I walked in that it was just wrong. It, it smelled like a lemon-scented dishwashing detergent, and it smelled like a... Y'all know that smell that an old iron skillet has? Old iron gone cold. Broke my heart. So we began to talk about food. And I wanted the recipes, 
but there was a problem with it. She didn't have any. She had she had cooked all those years without one written word. Since she was 11 years old, even if all she had to work with was neck, bones, pepper grass, or poke salad, she put good food on a plate. She cooked for dead broke uncles, hungover brothers, shade tree mechanics, faith healers, dice shooters, hairdressers, pipe fitters, crop dusters, high steel walkers, and deep well diggers. She cooked for iron workers, Avon ladies, highway patrolmen, sweatshop seamstresses, fortune tellers, coal haulers, dirt track daredevils, and dime store girls. She cooked for lost souls stumbling home from Aunt Hattie's beer joint and for singing cowboys on the AM radio. She cooked in her first 80 years more than 70,000 meals as basic as hot buttered biscuits with pear preserves or muscadine jelly, as exotic as tender braised beef tripe and white milk gravy, in kitchens where the only ventilation was the banging of the screen door. She put, cooked for people she just as soon poison and for the loves of her life. She cooked for the rich ladies in town, melting beef short ribs into potatoes and hot Spanish onions another woman's baby on her hip, and sleepwalked home to feed her own boys home canned blackberries dusted with sugar as a late-night snack. She panned fried chicken and Red's barbecue with a crust so crisp and thin it was mostly in the imagination, and deep-fried fresh brim and crappie and hush puppies redolent with green onion and government cheese. She seasoned pinto beans with ham bone and baked crackling cornbread for old women who tugged a pick sack and stewed fat spare ribs and creamy butter beans that truck drivers would brag on 3,000 miles from home. She spiked collard greens with cane sugar and hot pepper for old men who'd fought the hun on the Hindenburg line and simmered chicken and dumplings for mill workers with cotton lint still stuck in their hair. She fried thin apple pies and white butter and cinnamon for pretty young women with bus tickets out of this one-horse town and baked sweet potato cobbler for the grimy pipe fitters and dusty bricklayers that they left behind. She cooked for big-haired waitresses at the Fuzzy Duck Lounge, shiny-eyed pilgrims at the Congregational Holiness Campground, and crew-cut teenage boys who read comic books beside her banana pudding then embarked for Vietnam. She cooked most of all to make it taste good, to make every chip melamine plate a poor man's banquet, because how do you serve dull food to people such as this? She became famous for it, became the best cook in the world, if the world ends just this side of Cedar Town. But she never used a cookbook, not in her life. She never cooked from a written recipe of any kind and never wrote down one of her own. She cooked with ghosts at her sure right hand, and you can believe that or not. The people who taught her the secrets of southern blue-collar cooking are all gone now, all of them, and most of them did not even know how to read and write. Every time the old woman stepped from her workshop of steel spoons, iron skillets, and blackened pots, all she knew about the food left with her in the same way that when a bird flies off a wire, it leaves only a black line on the sky. Thank you all. Thank you. It's an honor to sit here and, and be able to talk with you about writing and good food and Appalachia. And we say, Certain amount of lying. But <laughs> we say red bird too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. This and is a cultural. Place. Yes, and that opening that opening scene is one that I have used multiple times in writing workshops to teach powerful opening and imagery. So it was really interesting to hear you talk about how you came about that idea, watching it, nature. It was, uh, you know, the, the thing about memoir, and we were talking about it earlier, the thing about memoir is um, it has to be rooted in history, and it has to be, like if you write about a thing that happened, it it better have happened, you know. And because while we may 
do book signings in San Francisco or Vermont or Manhattan, there are th tens of thousands or more than that people who, who know these people. You know, they might walk up to you and say, you think that was all there was to it? Let me tell you. But in memoir, you also get to write about your feelings. And uh, it, it is what happened, but it is also how you remember it and how you felt. And I remember not being horrified by that scene when I was a boy. And yet, a lot of you have seen it. I saw you nodding your heads when I, when I read that. They just do that. You know? They're not flying into the window because they don't know it's a window. I don't remember you know, being horrified. I just remember being very sad and, and thinking that what a waste of a, you know, a waste of a life it was. You know, and, and, and it, just, it just rode with me all my life. But deciding where in the book or if it belonged, you know, required some thinking. And I'm not necessarily good at thinking. Like I told someone I, I'm, earlier when we were talking, I, I, you know, I, I don't love writing. I love having written. Writing is a bitter, mean, nasty process where blood does not pop out on your forehead, but sweat does. And you're fighting with getting those words to lean up against each other so they don't all fall down. Y'all know this. I mean, you know, and, and so I, I, I don't love writing. I would have to lie to say I do, but I love having written. And I love talking to people after the fact. Like today, I love, I love knowing that we have a record of those people who, who went underground, you know, who worked in blast furnaces and half cooked themselves. You know, um, my uncles used to roll their sleeves up because they worked in, we called it the pipe shop, but it was U.S. Steel. They worked with molten steel. And they'd roll their sleeves up and you could see the scarring on their forearms. But it wasn't like uh, streaks, but it was spots from the embers, you know, from that flying. And uh, I thought, you know, why would you go into a place like that? Why would you go into a cotton mill that would take your fingers, hands, and arms? And I wanted to write about them. And I think that Redbird summed up a lot of them. Now, I was just thinking, you know, it's a tricky thing to write about the South. It's a tricky thing in particular to write about Appalachia. Uh, it's not easy. Why do you think... I mean, I say it, your, your writing is exceptional, but why do you think people from everywhere resonate with stories set in Appalachia and, and so much, I mean, the dialogue, you capture voice so well and you, you write, you can really hear the voice. Why do you think that resonates? I hate, you know, I've said this before and I, and I say it with a straight face, although it always gets a, I don't, I'm not sure people realize I'm being serious. We're just more interesting than most people. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, uh, you know, my 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 daddy was not manufactured. Faulkner didn't make my daddy. You know, the world did. How do you? Do, I went down into the Jim Walter mine in North Alabama, and um, it was the deepest mine at the time, one of the deepest in the country. And and uh, you know, I, I you're surprised by things underground, and one that it was all white. You know the line that they, you know, we put to, you know, and and uh, and you know, you'd ride on that trolley, and you'd have to lay flat or into the lap of the man behind you to keep from knocking your head off. And and once you got underground, it dawns on you, hell, I'm underground. <laughs> and to do that every day, but to have done it when our grandfathers did it, you know, to to go underground with an open flame. You know, and and shored up by hope. You know, showed up by hope and maybe prayer. Um, you know, but my people also, you know, they, in those cotton mills, they survive in a shift with your fingers, hands, and arms. It was a victory. Women had their hair pulled out of their heads, and they were all Church of Christ, Assembly of God. Uh, congregational wholeness, so they wore long dresses and long sleeves and long hair, and it would strip the clothes from their body 
those machines would grab them. And, and I, but more than that, more than just the fact that they were interesting and just tougher. Tough is interesting. Whiny and puny is not. You know, people always look at me and they say, my God, you're a lot bigger than I thought you'd be. And I always say the same thing. Well, did you think I'd be like spindly? Because, you know, riders tend to run small. I mean, let's face it. They're a, often a very fragile looking bunch. I mean, usually the strongest thing on them, why the, their, their tortoise shell glasses are, you know, got more resonance in their bones, you know, and, and, but I'm not from them. If it's okay, I'll tell a quick story of why we're more interesting. Uh, my Uncle Ed, I worked for him forever, and he was run over as a child. He had uh, both legs pieced together with bone, shattered bone, and steel rods. And he was the hardest working human I'd ever seen. He drove a bulldozer, drove a dump truck, worked with a pick and shovel on those legs, you know, those built up shoes. And, and my job when I was a little boy was to hold the chisel while he would swing at it with a, with a sledgehammer. And I did it until I got old enough one day to look up at him and to see this man in these oil stained khakis and this, you know, Winston dangling from his mouth. I never saw him actually take it out of his mouth. He'd smoke it down to a piece of ash that long and, and you know, grimy with sweat. And, and, and I, I just, one day it just occurred to me to look up and say, what if you miss? Because I'd have been crippled forever. And I'll never forget the look on his face. You know, he just looked at me and said, well, son, I won't miss. <laughs> And I, it occurred to me that no matter what I do or where I go, I'm never going to be that much man. And I'll never be as much man as my mama was. I just think we're just, by God, more interesting. And, and you know, we, our music. Anybody that's ever seen anybody you know, play claw hammer banjo? Or my uh, grandma could wear out a banjo, but so could my grandfather. She was a savant. Listen to Jimmy Rogers. Listen to him sing. And, and, you know, in five minutes, you'll know why we're, I think we're more interesting. And I guess the rest of the world's just going to have to try real hard to catch up. As anybody that knows me knows, I'm really interested in dialects and language mm -hmm. and voice. Sure. Um, have you run into problems with readers or editors because you use such uh, authentic voice? Well, what I do is this, is, is when it's in my voice, I try to, that's a good question. I try to, 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 I try to hold to the rhythms and the cadences, but not always, uh, the words. I think that the English language is a beautiful and elegant language, uh, lends itself to song, to, to music, and, you know, of course, literature. But most Yankee editors, and I got a brilliant one. I probably got the best Yankee editor since, Max Perkins was editing Thomas Wolfe. But they are probably more comfortable with the South as a veranda South, as a, y'all know what I mean, you know, as a, as a white column mansion South. So sometimes if you overdo the words themselves or the cliches, then you sound, you run the risk of sounding corny you run the risk of sounding like you just stepped off the set of Hee Haw. So what I do is when I, it's in my voice, I try to keep the rhythms and the cadences, but not necessarily the exact language. I tend not to use, is it conjunction or contraction? What's the one where you put two words together? But I try not to do that. I, I think that it's more elegant in my voice if it's written in you know, the Queen's English or the King's English, whichever one it is. I'm not much on facts tonight, am I? I I'm just, uh, but they'll all go home and say, boy, that Rick Bragg, he, he sounded good, but he didn't make a lot of sense. Um, but when I do use vernacular, I try to use it in quotes or where it is clear, and this gets right to the point, where it is clear, even if it's not in quotes, it is clear that someone else is speaking. And, and, and the, narrator, the narrator may be 
God or heaven or my Uncle Jimbo, but it's clear that, you know, and, and that way, the, the, like when I was reading about the kitchen earlier, there's very little vernacular in it. There's almost none in it. But believe me, if I'd read a paragraph further, you would have gotten the rich voice of, you know. I think it works so well in your work to bring you. your family to life. I think because you give them their voices. I mean, it just oh, thank you. makes such a difference in the work. Well, they deserve it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they, they deserve it. I, I, it's like we were talking about before. Um, they just say things. And, I, and y- your people say the same things. You, you know, you know they do. But... Uh, for instance, uh, and we said this earlier, but but so I apologize if Michael James recently died, and uh, he was ninety two, and he was the greatest liar that I believe, and this is accounting for a lot of Republicans, you know, <laughs> but he was a great liar. He was a magnificent liar. You know, he, he, he would tell you a story about, like, he told me a story about him and his daddy going on a coon hunt and, and they got tired. More than likely, they just wanted to sit down and get drunk. But, but they were leaning up against a big log and they set their lantern on the, the log and just listened to the dogs run and certainly had a taste. After a while, they saw a, a light passing through the trees. And then they felt kind of the behind them felt the log shift like an earthquake. Or then they turned around and realized that it was not a log; it, it was a snake, <laughs> a, a snake longer than this room, <laughs> maybe longer than a football field. And and he told it to me, you know, and had me believing it because I was five, you know. And but. He would also say things that were absolutely true, like at the end of his life, he would go wandering through the cemetery. And he would, uh, and I thought, again, I, I, I thought that was just so cool, you know, that, that it, maybe at the end of my life, I too will wander through the cemetery to see old friends, and maybe, who knows, maybe their spirits are there, and maybe they, you know, they speak to you. So in a very gothic way, I was thinking, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard of. This old man wandering through the cemetery. And then I said, Uncle Jimbo, why, why do you do that? And he said, because son, that's where the widow women are. And he was serious. So they deserve it, you know. And I, I don't think I, you know, I don't want to be gothic myself, but I, I'll never live long enough to, to capture all that is there. People always say, well, why haven't you done a novel? Well, when I run out of their stories, I will, but I don't think I ever will. Now, I, I probably will try to do a novel. But. How do you decide, do you ever decide not to include a story? Oh, yeah. And why? Because oh. I remember there's a passage uh, when you were writing about your granddaddy and you said that his daughters would never forgive you if you let his wings drag the dust. Right, right. So you want to be truthful, but you don't want to romanticize. Like, for How- instance... Um, and we were talking about this earlier too. You, you, in memoir, you get to say. But here's the thing: if you try to alter history or rewrite the past, they'll catch you. It will fail. And you know, so the only real power you have is if there is a a point or a story that does in no way affects the narrative in no way affects the perception that people are going to have. Is their heart going to be less broken or more broken because you didn't put it in? Is their respect, is their understanding going to be more or less? Then you have to put it in there. But if it is not greatly affecting the narrative, then yeah, you have the power to leave that little thing out. And... um. I do think I got most of what I wanted to get in about him because the things that they were, like my Aunt Juanita said, I was in line at a book signing and there were 800 people in a theater and they decided to sign books beforehand and the line was forever. My phone rings and it's my editor and she says, your book's at number four on New York Times bestseller list. And I thought, well, happy day. and uh, Or seven. I think it was seven then. And and I thought, well, that, that's nice, ain't it? 
And then they're all, here are all these wonderful people, and I'm just on top of the world. I'm just as happy as you can be as a writer. And it rings again. It's my Aunt Gracie Juanita, and she says, and believe me, cell phones were just now becoming. And it was her. And I said, I ain't need her. And she said, how you doing? I said, I'm, I'm all right. I said, and I had not talked to her since the book had come out, because this was like a week after it came out. So I said, what would you think of the book? And she said, it's all right. And I said, uh, what was wrong with it? And she said, uh, well, it seemed like all you had Daddy doing was making whiskey. And I said, well, he, he made it for 30 years. <laughs> she told me the stories. And she said, well, yes, hon, he did make it for a long time, but he never made very much at one time. <laughs> and besides, and this is what just boggles my mind, and besides, hon, and whenever they call you hun, you're in trouble. And besides, hun, you, uh, you didn't even put in that book about that time that daddy ran over Clem Ritter's head. Now understand this. This is a book about this man that, who became a kind of folk hero. He was already a folk hero in my part of the world. But all of a sudden, he's a folk hero in, you know, Massachusetts. He's a folk hero in suburban San Francisco. And now I'm hearing, I mean, with his face staring back at me from this gigantic stack of books, that he committed vehicular homicide <laughs> and they did not bother to tell me about it. So I said, and then, look, all these people. I said, maybe you better tell me. And she said, well, hun, there's not much to tell. She said, we were coming home from... And this story, by the way, is in the new book. So y'all don't have any reason to buy it now. But it was... Uh, she said, we were coming back uh, and uh, my grandma had fried chicken. But she hadn't just fried chicken. We don't make chicken like fast food chicken. We... The chicken is not triple dipped. As my mama says, eating chicken should not sound like somebody breaking a glass table with a ball peen hammer. <laughs> you know, it, you know, it, it, our chicken is damp and salt and peppered and dusted with flour. Not even shaken, just that damp chicken rolled in flour. And then you take two pieces and knock them together to get even more of the right. And then you fry it, and you fry it in a skillet, and you have to watch it like a hawk. But my God, you know, chicken don't shouldn't like hurt your gums when you eat it. And she had made not just chicken, but she had made hot biscuits and uh, water gravy, water chicken gravy. It's actually better than the milk gravy. Milk gravy is better at breakfast with sausage. But anyway, I digress. But she had also made her specialty, which was just fresh green beans cooked with red new potatoes. You know, halved if they were big, but left whole if they were small. And both of them cooked, not to mush, but just right. And that was waiting on them. So my grandfather was going down there, but he was late. And if they were late, she was just a viper. And, and he was a little bit scared. He wasn't scared of anything, but he was, you know, busting it down this dirt road, and these little girls in the cab of the truck, my mom, my Aunt Gracie Juanita, they were all little girls. And, and, and then my Aunt Juanita, and this is her narrative, said, you know, Daddy always drove with his foot flat on the floor anyway, and, and hun, we were just getting it down through there, dust just billowing up behind, and here she come, running right out of the weeds and the trees at the side of the road, all wild-eyed and crazy acting, and she ran right out in front of Daddy, and Daddy, and all stories in my family are punctuated with the words, my God. So I said, my God. <laughs> and she said, yeah, uh, we all piled out of the truck and looked down and Daddy had run over Clementine Ritter's head with his truck tire. And I said, my God. She said, yeah, hon, it was awful. You know, her head was was all mushed up and all womp-sided. And those of you who are not from the Deep South, womp-sided is W-H-O-M-P hyphen sided. And uh, my God, what did you do then? 
She said, well, we, Daddy picked her up and slung her back off in the weeds. <laughs> My God. <laughs> yeah. I said, you didn't do anything? She said, no. It, Mama had supper done. <laughs> I said, no, you didn't do anything. And she said, well, hon, we didn't have to. When we got home and we were eating supper, we looked outside, and here she come, staggering and weaving up in the yard. Her head was still all womp-sided and always would be. And only then did she bother to tell me that Clem Ritter was a dog. I forgot your question, but I felt that story was worth getting in the public record. It's a keeper. Yeah.